thank you for the people who are here. There will be probably some people joining uh, a bit later. So, uh, well, it's great to have Miguel, uh, who came to Singapore a few times already. Some of you may have met him there. So, uh, well, can, what can I say about Miguel? Miguel has, is one of these people that always surprises you with new research directions. So, you know, there are some researchers in our field that essentially, whenever they publish a paper, you can more or less expect what they are doing. And then some others who uh, really surprise you. Well, Miguel started with uh, doing his PhD with Antonia Thin by uh, pioneering this uh, technique that is called Navasquez Pironio Thin, uh, precisely with Antonio and Stefano Pironio, on uh, semi definite programs for quantum correlations. Then uh, he went on with uh, many works on uh, the uh, physical principles that could be underlying quantum theory, in particular macroscopic locality. And then, uh, in his own words, he destroyed that research field by inventing the almost quantum set that is widely considered as uh, the limit uh, that these, uh, these kind of approaches can uh, reach to come close to the quantum set and not, not further. And after that, he went to all kinds of other things, including uh, some contribution to the early works on the theoretical problem, the famous problem that was solved at the beginning of this year uh, by some computer scientists the one that is related to the embedding conjecture. And, uh, uh, and then there are well, also these works in time, works on many body systems. And he even has a work on uh, uh, optimal scheme or supposed optimal scheme to fund research projects without uh, competitions. You can find that on the archive. And uh, he was telling just me just now that he even worked on modeling COVID-19. So you see, we have a person here that has broad interests and today is going to speak about this work that he has done first himself and then with some of his collaborators about translating uh, uncontrolled system in times. Uh, Miguel, please. Thanks, Valerio. Thanks very much for the nice presentation. So yeah, I'm going to speak about, um, about these three papers. Uh, the first one is, um, um, it was published two years ago. Then we have this one that has been in, in archive for a year. And hopefully this year I will, we will see it published. And I guess I will make a party or something. If you're by Vienna, we invite you for some beers. And this is other one that is not even in archive. And I'm writing here, it's in progress. But actually, in, all the theoretical part is concluded. Um, well, what I mean by in progress is that we're in progress to seduce an experimental group to conduct the experiment. And I will speak about this at the end of the, of the talk. Okay, so first things first, I would like to start uh, by um, speaking about audiovisual systems in the 80s. So in the 80s, um, there was no Netflix or HBO, or maybe there was Netflix, but uh, some, some really weird thing where they would send you like some, some movies by, by mail, by regular mail. Uh, and for sure, there were no DVDs. No, the, 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 the system didn't exist. So you want to, to watch a high quality movie like Lady Dragon or Immortal Kombat or Bible Man 2, then you had to use a VHS tape. And uh, I'm really surprised about this image because it shows that VHS tapes were still being made in 2012. And I'm, I would like to know which, which strange creature on a VCR in, in 2012. Uh, a VHS tape is simply some system, some storage system that is magnetic. And in order to watch a movie in a VHS tape, what you do is to put the movie in a, in a VCR. Don't ask me what VCR stands for. I guess maybe it stands for video. And then this machine takes the tape and using a rotating head drum, it passes the tape through some reader here, and the reader transforms its part of the tape into, into sound and, and image. Now, uh, what happens when you finish watching the movie? Suppose you want to watch a previous scene. The way you did was to use the remote control to make to send a signal to the, this head drum here to rotate in the opposite direction. And that was called rewinding, and the effect of it would be that uh, you, you would uh, be, it would, it would put you in a different in a previous position of the tape you will be able to watch previous scenes that you already watched. Okay, so a few years ago, I started fantasizing with the idea of owning a remote control that would allow me to rewind not VHS tapes, but reality itself. That would be the ultimate universal remote control. And the idea or the vision that I had is, was that if I had this device in my hands and I pointed it at some quantum system, and then I press the rewind button, then the system would leap to the state that it had in the past. And if I press the fast forward button, it would lead to the state that it would have had in the future if I had not intervened in the system. Okay, so the, the first paper um, gives the first attempt that, that, um, at, at achieving this. And you could call it, I call it resetting, but now I call it heraldic rewinding. 
And the idea is that you have this remote control, but this remote control has a lead. So if you press the rewind button, two things can happen. Either the lead becomes green, in which case the system leaps to the process state, or it becomes red, in which case the, you cannot make any promise about the final state of the system. Okay, and more formally, the system you want to target it's a, it's a quantum system of non Hilbert space dimension. Now, mark my words, because this is the only thing that we will know about the system. We will know this number D, period. I will assume that the system, if I leave it alone, it will evolve according to some time independent Hamiltonian H0. But I'm not going to make any assumption of what this Hamiltonian is. Now, how do these uh, protocols work? Well, the role of the remote control is played by a quantum information lab. Within the lab, we can create or prepare any, any quantum system. And the problem is that the system that you want to influence is outside the lab. So in order to interact with the system, the lab is going to prepare some quantum probes. It's going to send them very close to the system and then back again into the lab. Over and over and over. Now, while the probes are inside the lab, they will interact with um, an internal register in the lab in a controlled way. And while they're outside the lab, they will interact with the target. But this is very important. If they will interact in an uncontrolled way, this means that I will assume that there exists a time-independent Hamiltonian regulating this interaction between the system and the, and the probe. And at this probably it will depend even in, in the relative position between these two systems. But I'm not going to make any assumption about what is this Hamiltonian. OK, in this protocol that I propose in this paper, at the end of the protocol, you measure this internal degree of freedom. And it's a dichotomic measurement. If the measurement is successful, then you have the guarantee that the system, the target, has led to the exact past state that it had at time minus t. This is t seconds before you started interacting with the system. And let me remind you the conditions. Despite the fact that I ignore how the system evolved, alone or together with the probes that I'm using, I'm using to influence it. So it is implicit in the definition of a rewinding protocol that it be universal. It is a, it, I use the same protocol independently of what these Hamiltonians are. The only thing that uh, these protocols depend on is the Hilbert space dimension of the system, the only information I have about the system. Now, the problem with this, um, this scheme is that um, it took uh, a long time to rewind a system. So in order to rewind a physical system by t seconds, you have to press the rewind button by d squared times t seconds, where d is the dimension of the system. Uh, so, so far, I've been using this nice metaphor of the remote control rewinding a VHS state, but actually a more honest metaphor would have been that of a pen rewinding a cassette tape, because according to my protocols, it takes a lot of time to rewind a quantum system. Now, of course, one question after this first paper was uh, whether this was unavoidable. So it, it could be that there exist better protocols than the ones that I defined that would allow you to, to rewind things arbitrarily fast. Or on the other hand, it could be that there's some physical principle at play that prevents you from rewinding things in quantum mechanics arbitrarily fast. <coughs> well, in the second paper, and this uh, follow-up, we, we characterize the, 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 the optimal rewinding protocols. And what we find is that, um, in general, it takes a lot of time. In order to rewind a system for an amount of time of t seconds, you have to press the rewind button. You have to do something on the system by d times t seconds. And the other thing that we discovered, and this, this broke my heart, was that there is no fast forward button. So if you want to, know, to pro propagate a quantum system to its future, and you don't know what the Hamiltonian of the system is, the only thing you can do is to wait. You want to propagate it to one million years in the, in the future, you have to wait for one million years. There's really no fast, there's, no, there's really no shortcut. Now, is this the end? Uh, no, because in, the, in this paper, we also consider what happens when you uh, use the control to address several systems at a time. So now the scenario that we consider is we have several quantum systems of uh, the same Hilbert space dimension. And I assume that if, again, if leave left alone, they will evolve according to some time-independent Hamiltonian. I won't make any assumption about this Hamiltonian, but I will assume that it is the same for all of them. They are the same type of system, if you want. So in order to influence the systems, again, um, we, we consider situations where we make them interact with some probes. And we are, again, we don't know how the interaction takes place, but we assume that it is the same for all of them. It has the same form, the same functional form. Now, the question is what kind of control transformations we can affect on these systems. And this is when things start getting crazy. Because the first thing we found out was that um, you can design some scattering protocols which allow you to swap the states of the systems. Now, you could say, well, this is a, a swap gate, right? I mean, it's not something new. Yes, it is a swap gate, but you have to think about how to implement this swap gate. 
The way I implement the swap gate is by sending some particles to interact with the systems. And no matter what this interaction is, the, if I have the promise that if I see a green light here, then I have the promise that these two systems will have been swapped. So it is a swap gate, but it is a universal swap gate. It's a swap gate that only depends on the Hilbert space dimension of the systems. And more to the point of this talk, we also investigate what kind of time translations you can conduct on the systems. So you're going to uh, implement some scattering protocol of some duration T prime. And at the end of the protocol, you expect each of these systems to be translated by different amounts in time. And these amounts can be negative. They can, you can consider the possibility that you send them to the past or maybe to the far future. Well, in the paper, we characterize exactly which time translations are allowed for in, in a given time T prime. And what we find is that you can deduce them from some simple rules that we call the rules of time translation. So the first rule is that you cannot create evolution time. And what this means in the context of one system is that you cannot fast forward a single system. Because in order to fast forward a single system, in an amount of time t prime, you would have made the system evolve by an amount t greater than t prime. But that would imply creating t minus t prime seconds of evolution time. And that would give you against this role. Now, this is not a problem if you have more than one system, because the second rule tells you that even though you cannot create evolution time, you can transfer it. So this means that there exists some scattering protocols that, if successful, will take all the time accumulated by these n minus one systems during the experiment and then transfer it to this one. In such a way that at the end of the protocol, the first system has evolved by n times t prime seconds, and the rest of the systems are in the same state that they had at the beginning. So fast forward is possible, but only when you have more than one system. And now the third rule is actually the first thing that we discovered is that you can invert evolution time, but it has a cost and the cost depends on the dimension. Now this limits the, the speed at which you can rewind a single system, but uh, you can save the day if you have more than one system to play with, because then you can invoke rules two and three, transfer and inversion. And then you can devise some scattering protocol that in time t prime, if it's successful, it will take the time accumulated by the systems, transfer it to this one, and then invert it. So at the end of the, of the day, what happens is that uh, uh, the system, the system one, has evolved uh, by an amount, uh, by this amount. And if, if you have enough systems, just because of this formula, you can send the first system several million years into its past in just a few seconds. Now, soon I will explain how to implement this kind of things, right? I mean, because it's, it's actually very counterintuitive that you can actually do this, this stuff. But before getting there, I would like to review some past scientific proposals to translate systems in time. So the first thing that you think, uh, the first thing that a physicist thinks when, when one hears about time translation is special relativity. And indeed, special relativity gives a very simple way to conduct time, time translation. The idea is like you take your system and then you set it on a journey outside Earth and then back to Earth. And if the system uh, during this journey experiences very high speeds or pass through uh, regions uh, that have a very, very high uh, gravitational potential, then when it uh, returns to Earth, you will find that it has not aged uh, the same amount that we have aged. People in Earth just aged a bit less. This is called relativistic time dilation. Now, operationally, what this means is that relativistic time dilation allows you to implement the slow, key, slow motion key functionality. Now, when I was a kid in the 80s, I didn't have a, a remote control with the slow motion key but one of my neighbors had, and it was really, really perturbing. If you, he, pressed the, um, he pressed the key, what would happen is that um, the, all of a sudden the, the characters would start moving very slowly and speaking with very, very low voices. It was completely pointless, uh, very perturbing, but also very funny. Well, this is what you can do with this uh, relative tech that time dilation. So how does it compare with the scattering protocols I was speaking about? Well, the advantage of relativistic tech dilation is that it applies to any physical system, not just to physical systems of a given Hilbert space dimension. Also, it's deterministic and not probabilistic. Actually, you may think that maybe there's a way to make the things deterministic, but there isn't, and I will explain you why at the end of the talk. And uh, of course, the, the, the drawback is that you can only do slow motion. You can only delay things. You cannot make them go backwards in time or send them to the future. Whereas with, with the scattering protocols, you can do all these things. Now, let's forget about uh, special relativity and, and think about uh, the, the problem of rewinding a system from the point of view of quantum information processing. The idea is that you have a system and you want to put, propagate it to its past. Uh, well, so you have to realize that the system, this state here, is just simply the result of uh, acting on the, uh, the original state with uh, some unitary operator. So you're able to implement this operator and you'll be done. 
Okay, so there are two ways of doing this. Uh, one of them is what I call the trivial way. In the trivial way, you know what this operator is, you know what the Hamiltonian is, so you will know what unitary operator you want to implement. But of course, as any experimentalist can tell you, that's not enough to implement a unitary operator. Also, you have to know how to implement the operator in the lab, how to implement operations in the lab. You have to have information in, about your lab systems that of the sort, if I press this red button, that the system will evolve according to some Pauli operation. So you need, you need a lot of information about the system. Now, there's another way to implement this rewinding, and I call it the ingenious way, and they describe in these two papers. They describe different scenarios. I recommend you to, to go through the papers to, to see exactly what these scenarios are. But the idea is that uh, in these papers, um, they achieve uh, this unitary without knowing what this H0 is. So you, you don't know what the unitary that you want to implement is, but nonetheless, you manage to, to apply it. These two works assume that you have total control over this system. This means that you can implement whatever operation you like on the system, you can implement. And the only problem of the system is that it has a natural drift given by this Hamiltonian, which you don't have characterized. Okay? Well, nonetheless, implementing this, this operation is, is non-trivial uh, in the way they, these, these people define, in the scenario these people define, and I recommend you to go through the papers. Okay, so this, um, this table tells you the amount of information that you need to create a rewinding using the trivial or, or ingenious protocols, right? To rewind a system the trivial way, you need to know the Hilbert space dimension, you need to know the Hamiltonian, which is d squared uh, continuous parameters, and also you need to know how your controls influence the system. So this amounts to knowing about of the order of these square continuous parameters. Now, using these ingenious protocols, uh, you don't need to know the Hamiltonian, but you still need to know these other d square continuous parameters that tell you how to control the system. Now, how does this compare to scattering protocols for rewinding? Well, these protocols do not depend on any continuous quantity. They only depend on one natural number, the Hilbert space dimension, period. If I write the table like this, you may think that uh, there's a logical progression and you might be tempted to complete the table and postulate that perhaps in the future somebody would come up with some other scattering protocol, some other method that allows you to uh, rewind systems without having any information about them. Uh, that would be really cool. It would be so cool that it's impossible. Actually, you can prove mathematically that this is incompatible with the loss of quantum mechanics. But even physically, and for this I didn't prepare a slide, so you have to use your imagination. Uh, let's try to understand physically why this, this cannot work. Suppose that I give you a device uh, with a button, with a nice red button, uh, that with the promise that if you press the rewind button, then uh, this device is going, to, um, is going to rewind the system that it has uh, near it. Okay? And uh, no, no assumptions about the, the size or dimension of the system are made, or the interaction of the, of the system with the, with the device. Okay? Well, now imagine that you press the button. Well, two things can happen. Either nothing happens, if the system, the, the, the pro uh, protocol fails, or it rewinds the whole universe. Because the fact that you don't know anything about the system means that it should apply to everything, right? I mean, how, how are you going to discriminate, I don't know, whatever you have in front of you from the rest of the universe, right? I mean, it doesn't really make sense. Uh, so actually, if you do the math, you, you find that it doesn't make sense, right? So I'm, I'm afraid that these protocols are, are general as it gets. Okay, so so far I've been speaking about protocols for time translation, and some of them based on uh, special relativity and some of them based on quantum information processing. So you may have the, the idea or the impression that uh, all protocols fall into one of these two categories. But actually, there's a very special protocol that actually takes elements from, from these two theories. And this is the time translator of Aharonov, Ananda, Popescu, and Weidman. Uh, I didn't know about this, this thing when I put my first paper into Archive and I, I was discuss, discussing these things with, uh, with Sandu, uh, Sandu Popescu, then I, I came up with this paper. And um, because the idea is so simple and uh, yet so ingenious, I, I can resist and I'm going to tell you how it works. So the starting point of the time translator is the same that I showed you before. You have a target system and um, in some initial state that is unknown. And of course, if I let it evolve uh, by itself, then after time t, the state of the system will be given by this expression. Now suppose that at time zero, I place some mass around the system in some, some distance r. So what will happen is that as, after some time t, the system will evolve according to this, this equation, where the only difference is that is this factor here. This factor comes from uh, the time dilation due to gravitational potential. And it depends on the radius. Now, with another leap of imagination, suppose that this radius is also a quantum quantity. It's also a quantum degree of freedom. And suppose that at the beginning of the experiment, at time zero, I set it up in a linear combination of different radii. So what will happen after time t is that the target system will get entangled with this uh, radial degree of freedom, according to this equation. And, uh, 
Finally, suppose that I measure and conduct some measurements on post selection on this degree of freedom, this radius. What will happen is that this, the original target will get propagated by this operator here. It's a linear combination of exponentials. Well, in this paper, they show that um, you can play with this, uh, this, this coefficient here in such a way that uh, this linear combination of exponentials very much resembles a single exponential with some factor alpha, provided that uh, the norm of the Hamiltonian and the time uh, are not very large. And the cool thing about this, this method is that you can make this, uh, this alpha uh, essentially uh, you can take arbitrary values. And these are the cases, of course, are when it is very large, in which case you're far forwarding the system, or when it is negative, in which case you're sending the system to the past. So this is really cool, right? I mean, it shows you that the time translator of these people can rewind fast forward and, and slow motion, uh, sending a slow motion in the system. But there's a catch. There has to be a catch. And the catch is this measurement here. If you compute what is the probability to that this measurement is successful, what you find is that it is astronomically small. Now, don't believe me, believe one of the authors of the paper. The last time I asked uh, Lev um, what, what he thought about this paper, he told me that the time translator has the same chances of succeeding as I have of delocalizing and relocalizing somewhere else. So that's the problem with the time translator. So even if you had the technology to construct it, you wouldn't bother because very rarely you would observe any, any effect. Okay, so how, how do you compare these two things, the time translator and the scattering protocols? Well, the advantage of the time translator over the scattering protocols is that this one allows you to fast forward a single system, where the, whereas this other one does not allow you. Also, uh, one thing in which they are more or less, uh, um, uh, I don't know, they, they have more or less the same score if you want, or, uh, or they, they have both problems, is that this one requires you have to have some bound on the energy of the system. And this one does not require you a bound on the energy of the system, but it requires a bound on the dimensionality of the system. And of course, the problem or the, the situation where this tentros later fails um, is because, because of this probability of success, which is really, really small. Whereas for the scattering protocols, as we will see at the end of the talk, the probability of success is reasonably high. Okay, so now I'm going to explain you how they work. Uh, so let's just go to the first case. Uh, it's a situation where you just want to influence or translate in time one system. So in particular, we want to try to rewind the system. Um, up to the, in, in an amount of time, um, actually the smallest amount of time allowed by quantum mechanics. And let's see if we can implement this. Okay, so first we, we have to consider what is the effect of a general scattering protocol over a, a target system. So suppose that uh, with this is the original situation, this is the original uh, configuration of the, of the game, of the scenario. Suppose I don't do anything for time delta t. So according to the assumptions, what will happen is that the system will evolve according to this time independent Hamiltonian. So the state of the system will be propagated by, by V, where V is simply this, this unit target, okay? And because we don't know the Hamiltonian, we don't know the unit target. Now, on, on the contrary, I could just not wait and send, and send a, a particle to interact with the system and then post-select it at the end. So what will happen is that uh, the system will get propagated by some other matrix, uh, W. This matrix will depend on which post-selection we conduct here and also on this unknown Hamiltonian. So therefore, we do not know what W is. Well, the, the strategy that I'm going to, to speak about consists in not doing one thing or the other, but playing with a linear combination of these two strategies. So what we're going to do is to, is to set, uh, the, to, to either to keep the probe in the lab or to set it up in, a, in an orbit close to the system, depending or condition on the, on the state, on the quantum state of some internal register in the lab. So if the internal register has a state zero, then the probe, probe will stay in the lab. If it has a state one, then we will release it and it will interact with the system. And if you do the math, what you will find is that when the probe returns, uh, the, the state of the system will get entangled with this internal register by this equation. So when the system, when the, sorry, when the internal register is in state zero, the target will be propagated by V, and when this is when it's on state one, it will be propagated by W. So you now imagine that we repeat this experience n times. We send this, we send n probes. So what will happen is that the, the target will get entangled with the internal register, which is composed by n qubits. In this way, so it's a linear combination of products of well, essentially the action on the on the on the target will be given by some product of these operators B and W. Then which product will depend on the state of the register. Finally, we're going to measure the register. We're going to project it into some pure state, and the result is that this projection will translate into into these, these products and. The net result is that the target will, will get propagated according to some expression like this, which is a linear combination. These are, these are uh, complex coefficients. Linear combination of these products of V and W matrices. 
Well, this is mathematics as a name. It is called a homogeneous matrix polynomial of degree n. Degree n because they are n products of matrices. It is a polynomial. Uh, it's a polynomial not of real variables or complex variables, but of matrices. Okay, the unknowns are matrices, and these are just coefficients. These are these are uh, this part is uncontrolled because we don't know what v and w are. But this part is controlled because uh, we decide which uh, which state we project the system. Okay, so so for now, and I will refer to this polynomial as p. Okay, we have some polynomial, a matrix polynomial on v and w that is acting on on, on psi. Now this correspondence is actually goes both ways. So what I have just shown is that um, when you apply scattering protocol, the effect on the on the target is to be propagated by a, um, a matrix polynomial of of the degree m. Now conversely, if you give me any matrix polynomial, then I can tell you some uh, scattering protocol that will propagate the system in the same way. So you have to you can think of scattering protocols only as as matrix polynomials. Okay, now let's dream. Suppose that there existed some a matrix polynomial with the property that if you evaluate it with matrices that are d times d, then the result is proportional to v to the minus s for some natural number s. Okay, suppose that this thing existed. Well, if this thing existed, we could devise some scattering protocol that implements exactly this transformation. And the end result, the net result on the, on the target, would be to be propagated by v to the minus s by this relation here. But what is d to the minus s? v to the minus s is the result of propagating the system s times delta t seconds to the past. Okay, so now what we have shown is that this, this protocol exists, provided that um, there's some uh, matrix polynomials of with this property exist. And the problem is, the question is whether these things are actually a uh, real. Okay, I'm going to make a parenthesis. Uh, suppose that you have two matrices, which are two times two, and then compute, you compute the commutator. Well, because the commutator is also a two times two matrix, you can express it as a linear combination of the Pauli matrices and also the identity. I will assume that sigma zero is the identity. But not quite, because the trace of a commutator is always zero. So the coefficient with, that goes with the identity should be also equal to zero. Okay, so what we have is that any commutator in dimension two, you can express it as a linear combination of the three Pauli matrices. Okay, now we square the commutator. We square the commutator because of the anti-commutation relation between the, the Pauli matrices. If you do the math, you find that what you get is a scalar. You get a, a complex number that depends on the matrices multiplied by the identity. Okay, this is an example of what people in mathematics call a central polynomial for dimension two. This is a matrix polynomial that has the property that when you evaluate it with two times two matrices, the result is proportional to the identity. Now, it's important that, that you realize that if I evaluate this polynomial, this, this, this expression with uh, three times three matrices, the result will not be proportional to the identity in general. Okay, and of course, the proportionality constant is not exactly a constant because it depends on the values of the matrices. Okay, so now let's go back to our problem of how to devise rewinding protocols. Suppose that the dimension of the target is two. And now let's call this polynomial that we described before, uh, f. And suppose that we evaluate f on w, v to the s, and v to the s. You do the math, you find that you get this polynomial. And you know that if you evaluate this polynomial with a matrix of two times two, it will be proportional to the identity because this polynomial is, is central. Okay, so now we multiply this expression by v to the minus s on the right, and what we get is that this polynomial here is proportional to v to the minus s. So we're there. We have shown that there exists rewinding and scattering protocols for dimension two. Now you can work out what is the amount of time that it would. Uh, take you to implement the scattering protocol that implements this polynomial and then compare it with the amount of time that this polynomial is rewinding the target. And you find that in some limit, the quotient between these two things is equal to one, which is the maximal, the optimal value. And what happens with other dimensions? Well, dimension two is not a special. There exists a central polynomial for all dimensions. And going through the, through the known families in the literature, we found that we can implement, we can use them to construct the rewinding protocols for uh, all dimensions and which are actually optimal in terms of uh, the rewinding time. So we're very lucky, right? I mean, nobody, because you, there are many families of uh, central polynomials, right? I mean, but the ones that people have found actually allow you to do the trick. Okay, it's imp an important thing about these protocols, these rewinding protocols, is that in order for them to work, it is enough that V is invertible. We don't, uh, we don't um, demand V to be unitary for these things to work. So this, this implies that you can apply this, these methods to decaying systems, for example. In the decaying system, the dynamics is given by a Hamiltonian, but it's a Hamiltonian which is not Hermitian. So this operator is not Hermitian either. It's actually something that the normal state will decrease with time. 
So what this means is that, is that if you apply one of these universal protocols to a decaying system, provided that the system has not decayed yet, you will be able also to send the system to the past. Okay, now I'm going to, to, to consider the case of uh, two target systems, and I will, I will only consider one protocol, the, which is the, the protocol that we described in the second paper, which is called optimal time transfer. And the goal is that in some amount of time t prime, we want to propagate the system one uh, two times t time prime seconds to the future, and system two, we're going to leave it in the same state. Well, an important thing about um, time transfer is that uh, if the targets are control systems, even if we no, do not know the value of H0, optimal time transfer is trivial. And I will show you why. Suppose that, well, these are the two systems, and suppose that we prepare the maximum entangled state, and then we show up these two systems. Now we wait for time t, and what will happen is that system one will get evolved according to, to this Hamiltonian, and uh, system two will not get evolved because we move it, we put it in some other place in some quantum memory, but what will happen is that uh, half of this maximum entangled state will get evolved. Now, the last step is that we conduct some uh, post selection on the maximum entangled state of these two systems, and this is like uh, this is a probabilistic teleportation to this point here, which already got active by this operator. So the net result is that the final state here will be the initial state of system one, but multiplied by, by uh, an, um, a, double, a double evolution. Okay. Now, why can't we implement this, this method in, in this scenario that we have? Because in order to implement the protocol that I just showed you, you need to be able to swap this, the targets by a control system. And that amounts to controlling the targets perfectly. So we're not able to do this, right? I mean, we assume that we don't have that control over the targets because they're outside the lab. Okay, so we have to work out some uh, scattering protocol to do this. Now, what is the effect of a general scattering protocol on two particles? Suppose that we uh, put some particles into a superposition of staying in the lab or, or interacting with systems, depending on some internal register, and then we measure the register. I'm not going to show the expression because it become a bit of a pain, but the, the end result on the um, joint state of these two targets is that is to propagate it by some expression of V and W that contains both dot products and also tensor products. Tensor products because you have two systems, simply. So we call these expressions a tensor matrix polynomial. And actually, this is a one-to-one -one correspondence between tensor matrix polynomials and these scattering protocols. Now, in the paper, uh, we cannot use, in this case, we cannot use um, past uh, research in, in mathematics. Uh, we came up with some, some new abstract entities, or uh, at least we, we, we have the, we're currently discussing with some algebra, and apparently this is a new thing in mathematics. We, came, we, we realized that there exists some tensor matrix polynomials that have the property that when you evaluate the polynomials with DMD matrices, then the resulting operator is proportional to the swap operator. Again, it's something very counterintuitive, right? I mean, but, but I mean, with explicit examples, you can just go and put in Mathematica, substituted by random matrices, and you, you, you see that you always get something proportional to the swap operator. It's a bit like magic. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, it means in particular that if I implement the, the scattering protocol corresponding to one of these polynomials, then the effect of, of, this, of this scattering protocol on the system will be to swap them. So we have what I promised at the beginning of the talk. We have the ability to conduct probabilistic swaps. Uh, but now, coming back to time transfer, uh, suppose that you, we take one of these polynomials, one of these swap polynomials, and then we construct uh, this expression. This expression, if you, you multiply it, is also a homogeneous tensor polynomial. Therefore, there exists some scattering protocol that implements it. Now, suppose that we implement it uh, on a system of dimension D. Then what will happen is that the expression here will be, uh, well, these two things will be proportional to the swap operator. So what we'll have is that this term here will be sandwiched between the two swaps, and therefore it will go to the left. So now, indeed, we have that the system will be get evolved twice. Now, again, if you work out the amount of time that it would take you to implement uh, the, the corresponding scattering protocol, and then you compare it by the amount of time that you evolve in system one, you find that uh, in some limit you get the, the optimal relation. Now, this is for optimal rewinding and time transfer. In order to implement any other time translation, all you have to do is to combine these three protocols, these three primitives. One of them is just waiting, you don't do anything, and then you can, uh, you can achieve whatever. whatever. Whatever is allowed by quantum mechanics. Now, I would like to speak uh, briefly about the probability of success of these protocols. Uh, I didn't speak um, before about this because I don't really have much to say. The probability of success on one of these protocols does not depend on the initial state of the system, on the, of the targets. 
it only depends on the free evolution of the system, on the Hamiltonian, and also on the, how the system interacts with the probes, period. This number, for very simple protocols, can be very big, can be equal to one, but sometimes it can be equal to zero. And it is equal to zero, for example, when there is no interaction between the probes and the systems. In that case, W is equal to B, and uh, in all the expressions we get, of course, we get a zero. This is obvious. Because if there's no interaction between the probes and the systems, then no matter what we do to the probes, we won't be able to affect any non-trivial uh, operation on the systems. So that's the reason, by the way, by the way, this, all these protocols are, are probabilistic. You, you cannot make the deterministic because you have to account for always for the possibility that the probes do not interact with the systems. Okay, because these things depend so much, this probability of success depends so much on the value of these two quantities, then a simple figure of merit that you could think of is the average probability of success. You average it over some distribution over the Vs and the Ws. Now, how does these numbers look like? Well, using a computer, we found really, really simple protocols for to achieve a probabilistic swap and time transfer. And we found the probability of success to be 0.7% and 0.02%. These numbers are very small, but they're not astronomic. In principle, you can do an experiment and measure these this kind of things, these kind of properties. They are small though, but uh, we do not think that this reflects some fundamental physical limitation. We think that it just uh, reflects the limitations of our computers to come up with better protocols. Actually, we conjecture, and this is just a conjecture, that you can devise a protocol for probabilistic swap or time transfer with uh, an average probability of success, which is arbitrarily close to one. And the reason we are optimistic is because of this paper in progress. In this paper, we saw that there exist rewinding protocols that have an arbitrarily high average probability of success. These protocols are a bit different from the ones that I, I was speaking about before. They have rewind these protocols in which the running time is not determined a priori. It's, it's a dynamical quantity itself. So when you start the protocol, you don't know when you're going to stop rewinding. And the way these protocols work is as follows. At the beginning, everything is the same. And actually, the first step of the protocol, the first round, is the same as the protocols I was describing before. You send some probes interact with the system and then you measure them. And if the measurement is successful, then you, know, you have the promise that the system has been rewinded. Now, what changes is what happens when what you do when, when the measurement is not successful. When it is not successful, you send more probes and again measure them. And if the result is successful, then you have the promise that the system has been rewinded to the right amount of time. But if not, then you have to go to round three and send more probes, etc., etc., etc. Now, in this paper, we prove that um, not for general unitary V and W, but for generic unitary V and W, this protocol will always hold. So, for generic V and for, actually for any pair of V and W uh, that do not commute, at some point the protocol will, will hold with probability one. The problem is that you don't know at what time it will hold. And finally, we'd like to speak uh, briefly about experimental implementations of, of these ideas. Um, this is one of the few few times in my life where I, I was uh, I was not sure what would people see in the lab because it is so weird. Right? You can rewind physical systems. It's so strange, right? I mean, I was expecting that quantum mechanics would break or something like that, right? But but actually no. There have been experiments based on these ideas. Um, this, here's this quantum resetting is the way I used to call rewind uh, at the time. In this paper, the the group of Jiang Weipan in Shanghai took uh, my first protocol for quantum rewinding and implemented it with photons. This protocol was not optimal. In this protocol, you need to press the rewind button by three times t seconds to rewind the system by t seconds. But to the other's uh, credit, they get a very, very good fidelity. It is, it is actually impressive eh? because the protocol is actually quite complicated. Now, my concern with this experiment is that um, this experiment, the, the, the way to model the target system is the photon polarization. And the problem with the photon polarization is that the Hamiltonian is trivial. So what does it mean to rewind a zero Hamiltonian? It doesn't mean anything, right? Because the system does not change by itself. So in order to make a meaningful statement or a meaningful experiment, what they have to do in the, in the paper is to take a crystal that is not characterized. It's a crystal that changes the polarization in some way. And then they identify this crystal or the action of this crystal as the free evolution of the system. And the idea is to invert this evolution, okay? Well, so far so good, but the problem stems when you start thinking abstractly what this uh, photonic, what a photonic rewinding experiment achieves. In a photonic rewinding experiment, you have a very complicated process that makes a photon pass uh, several times, uh, multiple times, through, through this unknown and characterized crystal. And what is the net result? The net result is the same 
anything that you would have achieved if you had passed the photon on the opposite direction. I think this is, this is cool, this is beautiful in a sense, right? I mean, it's a, it's a brilliantly complicated way of achieving something uh, very, very simple, right? I mean, I think it's artistic even. Uh, again, maybe you could put in a, in an exhibition of postmodern art, right? I mean, I find it very, very funny, a very funny experiment, but, uh, but it deviates a lot from the initial vision in which you have a remote control that makes a, a chicken turn into an egg. So what, what is what we, my co and I like now? We would like to convince some experimentalists to do the experiment with massive particles, which have a natural free Hamiltonian. We to do the experiment in a situation where, where the, the rewinding becomes a meaningful statement about the world. So now let me go briefly to the experimental proposal that we have in, in this paper. We want to um, conduct some, some experimental demonstration of a rewinding protocol with a dynamical running time. And what, is it, what are the cool things about this protocol? Well, the first run of the protocol is optimal in terms of rewinding time. So if the protocol is successful in the, in the first round, then you have rewinded the system in the smallest amount of time that is allowed by quantum mechanics. Uh, the protocol, as I said, uh, allows you to achieve a, an arbitrarily high probability of success. So the more you complicate the, the protocol, the higher the probability of success. The protocol is much simpler than the protocol uh, by, um, uh, implemented by Yang Weipan. Because in the protocol, uh, the protocol that you implemented, well implemented, was implemented in Shanghai required four probes and required entanglement between the probes. It was a really complicated protocol. This protocol only requires a target and a probe. It doesn't require any entanglement. And actually, if you don't have a probe, you can also use it with the target, provided that uh, you control the path degree of freedom of the target. So the idea would be to rewind some internal degree of freedom of the target but by controlling the degree of freedom of the, sorry, the path degree of freedom of the target. Another cool thing about the, the, the paper that we have is that um, for this particular protocol, you can, uh, you can compare uh, quantum versus, versus classical. In, in, in our understanding, in, in this, the protocol that we consider, a classical strategy would consist either in sending a uh, probe to interact with the system or just letting the system ev uh, evolve by itself. Whereas a quantum adversary or a quantum player uh, would play with uh, linear superposition of these two strategies. And in this case, you can see that uh, the, the gate fidelity between what you intend to achieve and, and what uh, you end up achieving is, is very, very different, depending on whether you have classical or quantum resources. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Uh, thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Miguel. Uh, so yes, we have, of course, uh, plenty of time for questions. I think, I don't know if people want to uh, just uh, unmute themselves and ask the question, but since we're not too many, it might be possible. Hi, right, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Hi, uh, thanks, Miguel, uh, for the really nice talk. Uh, so I'm still a, a little uh, baffled by uh, the assumptions of uh, not knowing how uh, the probe interacts with the target. Uh, so you say that you only have to assume the dimensionality, uh, but how do we know that uh, the the protocol that we implement is targeting the system that we intended to target. Yes, you have to assume that the system is closed, that, that you can somehow isolate it from other systems. Uh, the problem with when we have some other systems around is like having an environment. And we have an environment, you cannot rewind the system actually, unless you rewind the environment as well. Uh, and the reason is that, um, that ex okay, so, so unitary, you can always invert them, uh, physically and mathematically. But the problem with uh, with when you have um, uh, a you know CP map is that there are some CP maps that you can uh, you can invert uh, mathematically. If I give you a this is the matrix and I tell you, look, I got this, uh, playing this map. What is the original state? You can tell me. But if I give you the state, a physical version of the state, and even if I tell you I apply this this map, you cannot you cannot even probabilistically put the state back into this, its original state. Okay. So, but okay. it has really nothing to do with with. Um, uh, with controllability, right? I mean, it's just simply, I don't know, the environment makes things messy. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, um, could I ask, what happens when you rewind a system past uh, a measurement? So let's say I measure it at time zero, then I, I know it's in a specific state. And then when we when we uh, rewind it, what happens when we go back to um, before time zero? Do we reconstruct the state perfectly or, or what? 
No, what happened is, okay, what, what I mean by rewind is that you apply the Hamiltonian, but backwards, right? I mean, you apply the, the minus Hamiltonian. So, of course, if you interfere with the system, I mean, I'm assuming that the system has been closed and it has been evolving all this time alone, right? I mean, and all of a sudden you want to put it in a previous time. But if beforehand you, you did something, of course, that, that, that it, it uses information, then of course the system will not go back to the previous state. This thing doesn't violate causality. <laughs> oh, right, right. Okay, I see, I see. Miguel, could it be said by, for the question there about the measurement that uh, uh, a measurement would correspond to an interaction with an environment, in this case, a measurement device, and therefore, uh, if you don't rewind the measurement device, you can't. Uh, exactly. Yes, back. you can be like this. Yes, yes. Okay, any other questions? Uh, does not allow us to, to like rewind something that is uh, of continuous variable, like. Like kind of no, like. you need, no, no, and the, the reason I'm going to show you why. Um, okay, yes, it's because of this law. I'm going to smaller. Yes, it's because of this law here, right? I mean, so the this law tells you the amount of time that you have to spend to to um, rewind a system depending on the dimension, right? I mean, so the dimension is infinite, but the amount of time you have to wait is infinite too. Uh, so so uh, so this implies that you cannot rewind infinite dimensional system right yeah okay okay yes uh, and actually it, this 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 result is stronger than than than, than it, it also um, it is also true if you control the system so you have a system it has happened to them that you don't know but otherwise you can implement whatever operation on the system you're not going to be able to rewind the system faster than this mm -hmm. okay thanks mm -hmm. hello mm -hmm. uh, yes. first Thank you, Miguel, for the nice talk. Very interesting uh, ideas. I, 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 I'm actually learning. Learn, uh, I'm, I'm very beginner in this topic. But my question is, if we find unitary operation, no, not um, I'll say a way to apply Hamiltonian in the other way around to go back in time. But we only, but we, I'll say, first, we take a many body system and apply Hamiltonian for some time t. And we know some subsystem of this big ensemble, what was the exact state of it at the beginning without okay. knowing the best. I apply a unitary or I don't know, an unknown Hamiltonian and then try, uh, as you said, you can apply some other operator for an unknown amount of time and for sure you will arrive at the initial state, right? Mm -hmm. So if you apply this, uh, I'd say, this operator backwards only on a subsystem and you can know at which time you arrived at your initial state before the, the Hamiltonian, this unknown Hamiltonian, then what would happen for the rest to the ensemble for a many body system? So let me see if I understand. You, you, you try to apply a rewinding protocol over part of a system that's interacting with lots of things. Is this what you're saying? Because I yeah. Think so let's take the simplest scenario. I have two qubits. I apply an unknown Hamiltonian. But I know what was the initial state of one of those two qubits. I don't know the other one. That's I apply an unknown Hamiltonian, and then I try to go backward for, but we, by applying also the same global operation on both qubits, but only by looking on, at one Hamiltonian, would the other also go backwards or would it go into a random path? Yeah, but if you know the real state of the, of the first one, let me think. Okay, you know the real state of the, of, the, of the first one, then you want, you acting on one, you want to, until on the other one, you I act you on both to... of them, but I just watch one of them. But it's the so, same, right? Uh, well, I have know. I have two qubits. I know what is the state of one of them. Then you can the apply a rewind protocol that I mentioned for, and you rewind the whole thing, right? But this is independent of whether you know the, the state of one of them. I mean, if I have two qubits, I evolve them with an unknown Hamiltonian, and then try to bring them back to their initial state yes by looking only on at one qubit can i know that for sure the other also came back to the initial state okay 
Hey, no, that will depend on the, it depends on the Hamiltonian, right? No, because imagine, okay, imagine the situation where there's no even interaction between them, right? I mean, they could yes. be going independently, and of course, by, I don't know, by looking at one, you couldn't know what the state of the other is, right? Yeah. The, I, I, so this, the, this no is a, a zero, zero meter case, right? I mean, but... Uh, but both of them went through the same unknown Hamiltonian. But it's a joint Hamiltonian, right? Yes, it could be. The, the, they could interact with each other or they could not. But when I apply also the backward Hamiltonian, the, the rewind Hamiltonian, I also apply it on both of them. But are they independent or not? This is the part that I'm... I'm... So you, you want to apply a, a rewinding protocol to two of them or you want to apply two independent rewinding protocols to each of them? Actually, I don't know. I, I, the idea of my question is, can I, I'd say, observe the rewinding of one qubit and be sure that the other also would go backward, like correct some, I'd say, dephasing or some perturbation over the state of the second? Okay, in that case, okay, the way I understand is you have access to one qubit, right? I mean, you, yeah. the other way you don't. So the, the one qubit to which you have access is, is the, is the, um, is the, what's the word? The one qubit you have access to would be the, the probe, is what I call a probe. But uh, Miguel, so uh, aren't we again in a situation of environment? So, so I think your result supposes that the, the, these systems themselves may, may interact according, may have an external Hamiltonian H0, but they don't interact with any other system. They don't get entangled with any yes. other system that is not monitored, right? So if you have another system out there that is uh, meanwhile, uh, generating entanglement with the, with the, what you call the system, then your probe will never reset anything, right? Yeah, it won't work, right? But I think what, what he's describing is a situation where you apply a rewinding protocol over the two qubits and the two qubits are... Are, are, are interacting. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, well, that's, that doesn't follow from your result, probably. But what, what I don't know is what would happen if you apply two independent rewinding protocols to the qubits, to the two qubits, I guess. At the same time, I mean, suppose that they are too su successful, maybe, maybe that will rewind the, the two qubits. I don't know. I suspect not, but, but I don't know. So the, okay. the, maybe I ask the question differently. Does the rewinding Hamiltonian depend on the state itself or not? So, so what is the rewinding Hamiltonian? The, okay, I, you apply, you, you, you do something to the qubit. Ah, the, the, the protocol, the protocol, you mean, yes. the, the running protocol. The running protocol does not depend on the state. It does not depend on the state of, of anything, no. So I can take the first qubit, apply on it this protocol, and go back to my initial state, and yes. then take another state that I don't know, apply this unknown Hamiltonian, and, and then apply the same protocol that I figured out with the first qubit, and I am sure that I took off whatever evolution happened to the second qubit. But you don't figure the, but I don't understand. The protocol is the same. There's the cool thing about this rewinding protocols. It doesn't depend on the Hamiltonian. Well, okay, maybe uh, Zach, you can send your question by email and ah. continue the discussion uh, at that point, maybe with more, some equations or some drawings, it could clarify. This is the problem of having the discussion by Zoom is that we can't just uh, stand up and uh, draw what we have in mind on the whiteboard. Sorry. Yes. Is there any other question? Uh, yeah. I was wondering if uh, this can be applied in quantum error correction or something. Uh, I get this question very often. I, I suspect, okay, I think you can, uh, but I wouldn't do it. I think that there are better <laughs> methods for, for error correction. And so error correction is, is, uh, is robust against interaction with environment. Uh, this, this is not. And also it's probabilistic and error correction is now, I think, I think it's, uh, I don't know. Well, okay. The cool thing about this thing is you think it as an error correcting code is that you don't have, um, you have extra particles stored in the information. It's just the, the initial particle, right? You don't have to distribute the information on, on more qubits. But that's, that would be the only advantage. Okay, thanks. Okay. Have we satisfied our curiosity? Uh, I have one question. Uh, 
in the first law, it is stated that it's not possible to fast forward a system, but why is it possible with the, trans the time translator, the one with the relativity one? It, it is it is the it depends on what what assumptions you're making so in my assumptions i make I, I want to get to the exact state that the system will have in the future and 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 uh, uh, Haranov and his collaborators they want an approximate an approximation and the results are actually compatible because if you see the probability that they get uh, the probability as i said it decreases the, the greater the approximation you want when the approximation becomes perfect the probability is, it is equal to zero Oh, it's compatible, but, but yeah, I, I understand it's a bit misleading if, if I present it like this. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Clive? No? Yeah, I have a, actually have a question. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot for this talk. It was really um, informative. Um, from your paper, I think from what I understand is that, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, for the single uh, system situation, when you do the canonical scattering um, uh, case, the probability of success is dependent on the dimensionality. Um, from what I read, is that correct? Okay, it depends on the, the interaction. And of course, the interaction depends on the dimensionality. All right. So, with regard, so today, I think, I think you made the, the swapping or, or like the probabilistic um, quantum teleportation thing really very clear and it's actually really interesting. Um, but why is it, uh, is it the case that for that case, it's not dependent on dimensionality for, with regard to probability of success uh, no, for that the, equals to um, situation for like two look, systems? Look at the probability of success of all these protocols, they depend on the, let me show it again. Let's go. Probability of success depends on the, on these two variables uh, for all the protocols that we have, right? So if you go to another dimension, um, well, you, you get a different dependence, a different function here, right? I mean, but it still depends on these, these two things. But what happens, what, uh, maybe this goes in this direction, is that if you totally apply one of these protocols for dimension, say, three, and you apply it to a system of dimension two, the probability of success will always be equal to zero. Oh, OK. Well, I mean, okay, okay. It become, become trivial when we apply them to a system of a dimension smaller than the one that, that you're considering, and we apply to dimensions uh, greater. They are they're non trivial, but they are not sound. They, they won't they won't affect the translation. Okay. So okay, if it depends on V and W, it will ultimately depend on the Hamiltonian, right? Yes. Yes. Sure. Sure. Okay. All right. Sure. All right. Thanks. So what you just said, Miguel, just to clarify for me, is it, it, this is because these uh, central polynomials are very different according to the dimension, right? So if you if you guess a central polynomial for dimension two and your dimension three, it will not look anything like uh, like one. Yes, yes, yes. The, the structure is, is is completely crazy, and then the, the best way is to try to get them numerically because this, this is the way that you get them with the smaller uh, rank, sorry, smaller um, degree. And the, the 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 reason why all these things become zero is uh, you can see it in the definition of well, okay. Uh, how could I say it? Yeah, I don't have. I don't have really have. Uh, you have. Suppose I have a polynomial for dimension three, and you put a matrix that is two times two, but they have zeros, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, you. You. Okay. So no matter. I mean, because it's a polynomial of, of a matrix of this type, uh, the result is going to be some some box and then zeros. Mm -hmm. Okay. But then this has to be proportional to the identity. So it means that the box has to be equal to zero too. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the problem. Okay. Actually, the, the, the construction for the short polynomial makes, makes use of these kind of things. And these polynomials, I mean, uh, you said that at least for some of them, you found them in the mathematical literature, but how, uh, I mean, are they listed or is just one of these construction things, like a recursive thing, like, I don't know, Legendre polynomials in, in, a, in a normal function theory that are given by uh, some recursion rule, or is there still a list of them? No, or? It's, it's, it's a, the specific, okay, uh, people haven't found all of them. I think in dimension two, they know how to generate them all. It's like combining some, some uh, smaller polynomials. And dimension three, I think, is, is unknown. Uh, and the families that they find uh, is explicit. It's explicit construction. It is very, it is not sophisticated. In the sense that you don't need to know much mathematics. It's just, uh, the guy who came up with it was very clever. Mm -hmm. But, but, but is, uh, everybody can, every physicist can understand these papers. This is the cool thing about this, this area. OK, are there any other questions? Well, if not, then uh, I think we can uh, thank Miguel for a very clear and informative talk. Uh, let's see if he has left anything for us to do or if uh, 
all the problems have been solved? No, 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 no. There's no, no problems. <laughs> okay, then uh, we'll discuss. Uh, and uh, well, so see, see you soon, uh, hopefully in Singapore, and I will come in Vienna. And uh, thank you. And guys, all of you who attended, thank you for attending, and uh, see you soon, maybe in Singapore. Thanks, thanks, thanks for attending, guys. See you. Bye.